Will you all pray with me? Lord God, um, I think each one of us needs some encouragement and some hope. And I believe that that comes uh, from you, Lord God. We need guidance in this world. Some days we feel like we've got it figured out, and other days we're just not quite sure where we're going. We, we need you to show us. God, help us be willing enough, moldable enough to be changed by your word and by your spirit that we might experience a deeper sense of joy, a deeper sense of hope because of you. God, we're grateful for your word, even though the parts that kind of uh, seem to rub us wrong, we know that all of your scripture is good for us. And so help us hear your word as we dive into it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what is Lent? Um, just so you know, Lent is a tool. We don't worship Lent. Uh, there's nothing in Scripture that says you better Lent or you're in trouble or anything like that. Um, and there's people who have grown up who have families where Lent is like a big deal. And other people say, I don't even know what the word means. And some of us know enough about Lent to be really dangerous, right? Just enough. So I remember I went to Milwaukee. My brother was finishing a, uh, his Ph.D. degree, and he was at Marquette University right before um, Easter. And so we're in Milwaukee, and he says, hey, we should go to a big fish fry in a beer hall. And I thought, well, that sounds great. So we all go down to this big beer hall thing where they're doing fried fish, coleslaw, and there's a polka band, right? The happiest music ever. And people out there kind of just dance like this and, you know, and – playing all these funny instruments and tubas. And, and it was just this delightful time. You know, who doesn't love fried fish and polka? And, uh, and then I remember thinking, like, wait, what's this big celebration for? Oh, Lent. Yeah, fried fish and polka. What? You know, like, oh, that's what Lent is. You know, asking people, oh, yeah, we're, we're observing Lent. I'm like, that? So, and then other people, you talk to them, it's, it's all about chocolate, right? Lent is like, I gave up chocolate. And, and you're like, hurting yourself for 40 days, not eating chocolate, you sweet tooths out there. And then what happens on Easter Sunday? You grab the Cadbury eggs and, yeah, oh, oh. and then, whew, that was such a holy experience. <laughs> Let's be honest, a lot of us have done that at Lent, right? If you, pr if you practice, you, I'm going to give up something. And, and it's somehow, is it a holy experience or do you just torture yourself with no chocolate and, and things like that? So what is it? I want to dive into it a little bit more, but um, the 40 days, so we're going to celebrate from Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, to Easter, to the cross and to the empty tomb, not counting Sundays, 40 days. So in the Old Testament, we look at the 40 years of the Israelites wandering in the desert, and we can, we can learn something from that during Lent. And Jesus, as he was tempted for 40 days, we can learn something from that as well, and that's kind of what we pay attention to uh, during this season. But I want you to think about this. This is what Lent is, and I want you to keep these two words in your head. Lent is about repentance and renewal. Repentance and renewal. And I really believe that if observed faithfully, I think Lent can revive our faith. I really do think that as we pay attention, uh, repentance and longing for God to renew our lives and renew our faith, I think he can blow a fresh wind in us as a church and as individuals during a season like this. It's actually really powerful, and it's so much deeper than polka and fried fish and chocolate. Um, there's much more to it. So if you think about it, Easter, I would say this might be not correct, but I would say Easter is kind of like the Super Bowl for Christians, right? It's like it's a big deal. You know, we get special outfits sometimes, and you know, people don't go to church all year, but it's like, we got to go to Easter. There's ham and there's Jesus. Here we go. And so everybody rolls out to Easter. But for any event like the Super Bowl, people didn't just show up and play at the Super Bowl. Or if you think of a big event like a wedding, most people don't just plan a wedding that day and go to it. Some of you maybe have. But most of us take months and we prepare for this thing. And that's what Lent is. That we don't just do a drive-by past Easter, and that's what happens to a lot of Christians in our culture with both Christmas and Easter. We say, oh, honey, it's Christmas next week. It's Easter next week. Ooh. But something happens when from, from uh, 40 days away, we start looking at the cross and the empty tomb and start paying attention and reflecting kind of in our own lives to what it looks like to repent and to experience um, renewal. So this is what Lent is. So I want to talk about a little bit about this journey of Lent and what it requires. 
And the first one is, is this, is the journey of Lent requires spiritual inventory. Now, some of you I know well, others I don't know. I, I wouldn't ask you this question if we just went to tea or coffee for the first time. But here's, a, here's an interesting question. If you had to give the State of the Union address for your soul, what would you say? Like if I asked you to give me the State of the Union address for your heart, for your soul, what would you say? Another maybe way to look at it is I like to think about gardening. I like to garden. I've always been interested in gardening. Um, I don't have one right now. I want one desperately. But, but think about your spiritual life as, as a garden. How would you describe it? Overgrown, fruitful, organized, thorny. How would you describe, if you think about your faith as a garden, what would you say? This is what I, I, I want you to do during this season of Lent, is to take inventory of the soul, of the garden, of the heart. And here's one thing I, I want to give you that I think is helpful. As you're thinking about this spiritual garden or your life, look at Galatians 5, And it's when we learn about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, just remember, if we're wondering, people ask me, how do I know if I'm a Christian? Or, and they struggle with some of these things. When we see that God... God's Spirit is at work in our church or in our lives. One of the main ways we know is we start to see this fruit. So as you're taking inventory over the spiritual garden, you're asking yourself, self, do I see love? Do I see joy? Do I see peace? Do I see patience? Do I see kindness? Am I good? Am I faithful? Am I gentle? Do I have self-control? And then I love that last line that Paul says. You can't get in trouble for going overboard on these things. Right? There's no law against being too gentle or too faithful or too kind. So during Lent, think about these things. Am I seeing the joy of the Lord in my life? Is there that fruit on the vine? Oh, there's that joy fruit. There it is. Oh, there's patience. I see it. But then on the other side, besides fruit, you've got to look at something else, which maybe doesn't sound as fun, but it's helpful, is weeds. Do you identify thorns and weeds? So look at Luke 8, 14, and this is... Um, this great section of the sower, the parable of the sower. And Luke explains at the end, he says, the seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So keep that up there for a second. I know for me, I can look at my kind of the spiritual condition of my life and my soul, and I might say, oh man, I see some weeds and they're about worry, about things that are out of my control. I see some thorns that are about these riches or pleasures that I want so badly that I don't think I really need, but it's starting to choke out the strawberries and the blackberries and the other fruits in the garden. And if we're honest, some of you might be too hard on yourself. You don't have a garden full of thorns. And you might think of yourself a little too highly. I don't think your garden is all strawberries and blackberries. But we pay attention to those things as they show up. And this is why repentance and renewal is so important for us during Lent. So literally, if you're, you have a garden, know this, that weeds and thorns hurt fruit production. If our garden is full of weeds and thorns, it will hamper how much fruit that we experience. And so here's where I want to go with the repentance piece. Weeds have to be addressed. If you look at your garden and it's overgrown, you've got to do something about the weeds. If you don't, you won't, have, you won't have any fruit. So addressing the weeds is something that we, it's what we do during Lent. It's part of what we pay attention to. Um, we'll especially look at that at Ash Wednesday. But one of the ways we look at the weeds is to repent. And we've talked about this before, but never forget this definition. It's really helpful. Whatever that thing is tonight that you're thinking, okay, this is the weed or the thorns in my life. It's anger, it's pride, it's addiction, it's something like that that is causing me to have this big roadblock or distance between me and the love of God and understanding the power and the love of God. To repent is not only to turn our back to whatever that thing is, but it's actually to walk away and walk towards God. That's repentance. Peter talks about it, Acts 3. He says this bold statement to people who are kind of being wishy-washy in their faith, and Peter says, Repent then and turn to God. So you don't just say, oh, I've got to turn from this awful thing. But we turn and walk towards him so that your sins may be wiped out. I like that term. 
and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now think of it. This is a great verse that sometimes we overread. So repent. Okay, that sounds like some hard, heavy heart work. Sure, I'll repent. So that not only our sins will be removed, but that you'll experience deep refreshing in the Lord. Who doesn't want to be renewed or refreshed in the Lord? But part of that is the hard work of repenting. Like if I want to have a muscle body, i got to actually go lift a weight, right? i got to go sweat some. So there's a little bit of work involved in turning from those things and walking towards the Lord in it. Identifying the weed and actually doing something about it. Um, and you all know how weeds got to be pulled out by the root. In Colorado, we had these weeds. I, I, I'm convinced that they went down to China. They had like these long carrot type things, and you had to get in there. My neighbor was like, oh, get them right. Don't just pull out the top. And you pull, and you would pull. It's kind of one of these like, oh, my gosh. And once you got it out like that, it wasn't going to come back. But some of us get lazy with this process, and we just kind of nip the top. Well, there's the weed's still there, and it keeps coming back. So we have to address it at the root. And one of the ways I think we do that, and what I'm going to talk about tonight, is fasting. Now, fasting is something some people understand and some people don't, but it's a huge part of Lent for a lot of people. And essentially this, a biblical fast, and most of the time you see it in the Bible, it has to do with food, but it doesn't have to just be food. But people would give up something so that they could fill that space with God. So you're fasting so you can focus. Put those two words together. We fast so that we can focus on God. Not just giving up chocolate because we're trying to lose a couple pounds. We're not giving up carbs or anything like that so we can fit in that dress for Easter. That's not the point. But it's so that we can focus on God. And that's what happens when we think about what are we depending on. Are we depending on our stuff? And we don't realize how much we depend on some earthly things. Or are we really depending on, on God for day-to-day lives? Fasting shows up 50 times in Scripture. And let me tell you different reasons why people fast. People fast because they need to hear from the Lord. So they'll, they'll skip a meal or, or they'll do something in their day. They'll do without something. They'll do without TV. They'll do without uh, surfing the Internet. And they'll spend that time because they want to hear from the Lord or they want to intercede. Right? They want to fast because they want to intercede on, uh, because of their marriage or someone else's marriage or the country or the church or why people intercede, or to repent, which is a, a big reason what people do uh, during Lent. So Jesus talks about fasting uh, in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. And there's this little section where Jesus talks about the poor, and he talks about fasting, and he talks about prayer. And they're real tiny little sections in the Sermon on the Mount, like this. And he uses this same phrase three times. When you care for the poor when you pray, when you fast. So he doesn't say, just so you know, if you feel like getting around to caring for poor people, you should. If you're up for praying and you think it might be fun some afternoon, why don't you? Same with fasting. But we know less about fasting, I think, than we know about caring for the poor and uh, about praying. And so Jesus is upset uh, with them because here's what's happening in this text that I'm about to read. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. So just so you know what's going on, the people of that time wanted to act real spiritual. It was really important that you could look at us and know that we're spiritual. And so they were fasting, which is a spiritual habit, but they'd be like, oh, you know, going around have these faces, oh, we're so spiritual. And Jesus is like, oh, my gosh, stop. I know he rolled his eyes. I know at that moment Jesus is like, good heavens. So here's what he says. I tell you that they've received their, uh, their reward in full. Next screen. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Take a shower. Look regular. You know, don't go around like, look at me, I'm so Christian. No, he's saying, wash your face, take a shower. And then I think there's another verse in there. So that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, think about this for a second. When we fast, it actually seems to get to the root of some of these issues that are wreaking havoc in our spiritual lives. And when we get to the bottom of some of these issues with the Lord in prayer, we start to see more fruit in our lives. But it requires this this hard work to happen. I have a friend this week who is in a private discussion, um, so it wasn't like he was saying this out loud, but just with a couple friends that we meet with, and he said, 
uh, we've been in a season of fasting, and not many people know about it, but I've been praying and fasting over my marriage and um, just really trying to be open to what God might do in our marriage. And his wife had no idea he was doing this. But what happened was that God did something really powerful in him. Because sometimes in a relationship, um, when there's a, a, a distance, with it, whether it's with a boss or with a friend or a family member or anything like that, our tendency is to go, well, if they would just get their mess together, we would just be fine. If they would fast during Lent, then we can, you know, we can get together. And so he said God did an amazing work in his life. His wife had no clue that he was doing this, and he started seeing their marriage just turn around. For two years, we've been praying about their marriage, and it is starting to turn a corner, and she is noticing it but has no clue that he is deep fasting in fast over this relationship. What happens in fasting when we give up something to spend more time with God um, is it actually reveals what controls us. So think about that real quick. When you fast from something, it, it can really reveal what is actually controlling us. Has anyone ever heard of this whole 30 fast? Oh, I heard the groan. Um, I tried it, so I have some friends that were all into whole 30. I know Taylor's done this. So it's it's this deal where you cut out essentially a fast, and a lot of it has to do with sugar. You cut out sugar. Well, someone warned me. They're like, look, if you like sugar and you just totally cut out sugar, at like day seven or something like that, the sugar witch is going to come out, and you're just going to, like, be careful. You're going to hurt people because <laughs> you're going to be so, you know, or some of us, if you give up coffee, I'll just be, you know, honest. Like, if I don't drink coffee, I'm just not pleasant. And so what are some of these things that control us. Because if you think about sugar when it comes to the Whole30 diet, what does it say about sugar? You can say, oh, no big deal. It's not that powerful. Well, you just turned into a witch, right? You just turned into this. Rrr. But what about social media? I remember doing a meeting one time with 60 adults who work at a church. And I just said, hey, we're just going to really focus on prayer. We're going to get some scripture. Would you all mind turning off your phones and just kind of putting them over there? You would have thought I kicked their cat or something like that. Like, <clears throat> I can't give you my phone. And so adults will pick on kids about what they do with games and all this stuff, but we're just as bad with our phones. And when we're asked to have a social media fast or a phone, you know, to put it to the side, does it control us? And we make excuses like, my work needs to get a hold of me at 2 in the morning on Sunday. Maybe. But are, we, are there some things that are controlling us that don't need to control us? Are you depend, too dependent on something? Are you too dependent on someone? Do you have it or does it have you? I think what Jesus is saying is repentance is an inside job. Don't go around telling, hey, look, everybody, I'm repenting, I'm fasting. But there's something inside, I think, some work we need to do. I, I think it's this idea that you could look at soil and say, boy, that soil looks good from a distance. But if you get up close, you might realize that it's void of nutrients. And I think we have to be honest about that. Um, one of the analogies I was thinking about this week, and I should have brought a golf club. I didn't, but I'm not a great golfer. Um, but if you know anything about golfing, when you go to golf, it seems like 75% of the time, if you take a lesson, they're talking about grip, not about what kind of ball or what kind of shoes, but they're talking about how you hold the club and are you gripping it too tight and where do you put your thumb and your finger and all these things about grip. And I actually think it's an incredible analogy for the Christian life. What are you holding on to? What are you holding on to too tightly that God's saying, that's not even yours, that's mine? What are you holding on to that's just earthly? You're like, oh. You know, the Christian life, this whole thing about the open hands farm, I, I go back to this phrase all the time, and this is a great posture of faith. The truth is that Nate Stratman feels more comfortable sometimes when I go like this. I got it. I got it. And so I think this great thing, like the golf coach would say to me when I took lessons, he'd say, hey, boy, check your grip. Check your grip. Okay. So what do we do at Lent? We check our grip. What are some of those things that we're holding on too tightly to and maybe need to open our hands and see what God can do? That during Lent, um, we realize that we're called to really cling to God and not to some of these things that we have holding on too tightly to. As a pastor of this church, I want to say this, and I've never done this before, but I really want to invite you, whether you think this is your church or not, you're here, so I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to a, a season of repentance and renewal as a group, as a church, as individuals. I've, I've actually asked the elders of this church 
to, to fast as well on the, for the sake of the church? Is there something that we need to repent of as a church? Do we need renewal? We always need renewal. And so I would love for our leaders to lead in this, but I want you to think when we start Ash Wednesday this Wednesday, what is something that you have too tight of a grip on? How does your posture go like this? How do, how do you long for a deeper renewal in your faith with Christ? So here's just kind of real practical things. Just name the weeds. What are those things? Is it some kind of addiction? Is it some kind of love of money? Is it some kind of um, pride? Whatever it might be, you're not alone in it. But to name it is kind of the first step before we go forward and that thing that you're holding on too tightly to. And then the second thing is I want you to think about is not just subtraction, but addition. So when, when people think about Lent and they say, oh, I just give up chocolate. Okay, what for? What are you adding? Right? So you're not adding candy and giving up chocolate. When you give up something, you're making space so that you can draw closer to God. So if you, let's just say you come home from work and you spend a couple hours watching ESPN, could you maybe spend one less hour doing that and spend that hour really trying to get into Scripture, really trying to pray? Uh, whatever it might be, how you use any of your time, could you give up some of that and add something? For some people, that's a certain meal. They want to give up a certain lunch or a breakfast and spend that time in prayer, spend that time reading Scripture, whatever it might be. That's the reason why we're doing this series, Prodigal God. It's one more thing that we can be clinging and, and having greater focus on God. But to do that and to study that, you have probably have to give up something in your schedule in order to make room to really hear from God and not just check it off the list. Um, Steve Risley said something. He's not here tonight, but at the man treat, he was just sharing his story. And one of the things he said wasn't deeply profound, but it was pretty true. He just said, you know, when I start the morning trying to pray or to read some scripture or to journal a little bit, my day just looks different. The other morning, uh, it was a pretty terrible morning for me. Uh, I'd ruined my laptop with coffee. I was talking to Blake, and I knocked over my coffee and ruined my laptop. And then I told something to Eric that, that was wrong on some date and totally mixed up these dates for Ash Wednesday. And I was just all over the place. And Eric goes, have you prayed today? No. <laughs> I will now. But he wasn't, he wasn't being sassy or anything. But there is something about we get so going, you know, even the pastor of this church and doing all these things that we want to do for God. Have we just stopped and made, made space to really spend time with God. And I thought Eric was being kind, but he was actually being prophetic that day when he said it to me. Um, just so you know this, there's a danger sometimes uh, in Lent that sometimes think what people think what you're doing is you're persuading God to love you more. Don't do that. You don't have to persuade God to love you more. You have no clue how much God loves you. This isn't about, hey, if I just fast a bunch, he'll like me more. It's not true. He loves you in a profound way, so you're not trying to persuade him. And you're not being legalistic about this, right? I'm going to try just to eat one cracker. Oh, she ate two crackers. and oh, You know, uh, calm down. It's about growing a closer and deeper connection with Christ. And so if, if you're talking about too much chocolate and not Jesus, then you need to switch from chocolate because that's not the thing. But there's something else that you can give up to add and to add a discipline to spend more time with Christ. And at the end of the day, one of the things we have to remember is that sin distorts our view of God. And so when we repent, it helps us have a better view of who he is. So this is the beginning of renewal. If, if you're feeling spiritually funky, in some ways it's because you're seeing God in a way that's distorted. But when we see God for who he is, we start to experience renewal. This is why we're doing this book on the prodigal God, because it's an incredible picture of the Father. And some of us have developed a warped view of God. Like this idea that you have to persuade him to love you. That's not how it works. And so we get this right view of God, which helps us experience deep renewal. The, the Christian life is full of both feasting, and, and you'll see that we also fast. We do both of these things as Christians. And so tonight, as you smell IHOP over there, we're going to feast. And there's feasts all through Scripture. It's important that Christians celebrate. But when we fast, it's when we're paying attention to what we're holding on to too tightly. And so starting Wednesday, I'd love for you to be thinking, what is that? And I want to address that. And how do I address that with the Lord? And my prayer is at the end of the 40 days as we get together and celebrate Easter, that there will be some incredible stories of how God is working in your 
work, your marriage, your heart, this community, this church. I can't wait to hear what happens. Check your grip. Address the weeds. And in that, God will begin reviving your faith. I believe that. And your heart. Let's pray. Lord God, as we uh, just in a couple days begin this journey towards the cross and the empty tomb, I pray it's not just some legalistic thing or some empty tradition, but there really is a journey of honest repentance and deep renewal. God, some of our hearts have gotten a little tired, a little gray, a little weak. We need a breath of your fresh air, your spirit to blow in us and to revive us. We long for renewal. God, be with us in this journey and walk with us as we go. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.